Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, and in today's episode, we're going to be looking at three relevant news stories, including one that's asking the question, did Australia just legalize psilocybin? We're going to be looking into and digging into some rescheduling down under. We're also going to be looking at the announcement of funding by the government of Canada for three new studies on psilocybin-assisted therapy. These are looking at some really important issues and could have a major impact on policy going forward. And finally, we all know that mycotechnology is cool, but it's also really difficult to scale. We're going to be looking at a very promising mycotechnology company that just had to cease operations on one of its most innovative mushroom products. So if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps get the show out to more people. And if you want to see future episodes of the show and help us reach our goal of reaching 1 million mushroom-loving subscribers on this channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. We appreciate it so much. Let's jump into the show. On to our first story. Now, this last week, there were some major headlines that involved psilocybin on a global scale, and I still can't really decide whether or not it's that big of a deal. So I'm going to let you decide. And here's a headline. It was in Nature magazine, but it was also uh, in a lot of other places. And it says, Australia to prescribe MDMA and psilocybin for PTSD and depression in a world first. Decision to make the previously illicit drugs available is dogged by suggestions that it was rushed. And at first glance, Glance, I do agree that this kind of seems like a big deal. I'm trying to imagine like a five years ago version of myself reading this headline. I probably would have been quite surprised. So what this is saying is that psilocybin, and I'm going to focus on the psilocybin aspect of this because this is the mushroom show after all, but psilocybin has now been officially rescheduled in a major country in Australia. So it's moved from schedule nine, which is considered a prohibited substance to schedule eight, which is considered a controlled substance. This is actually a major change. And why some might think this is pretty important is because rescheduling of anything is an absolute Herculean effort. I know I've talked to lawmakers in the US and lawyers in the US and they say rescheduling, sure it's possible, but these things take a lot of time, they obviously take a lot of money as well, and it's just really, really hard to do because once laws are created, it's really difficult to unwind them or change them. So a rescheduling from prohibited to controlled is a big deal. So you might start to wonder, is this gonna cause some sort of a domino effect where other countries follow suit? Is this the true re-emergence of psilocybin as a medicine, as Paul Stamets recently said? And to be honest, I don't really think that is the case with this rescheduling in Australia, because now the rules in Australia are not that different from the current rules in some other countries, such as Canada, or even some US states like Oregon and Colorado. For example, here's how it's going to work in Australia. Psilocybin is not available to anyone. First, it must be prescribed by a psychiatrist after pre-approval by the Therapeutic Goods Association, also known as the TGA, in something called the Authorized Prescriber Scheme. It will only be prescribed for very specific treatment-resistant depression, so basically depression that has shown to not be effectively treated by any other conventional means. Finally, it will only be available for access in supervised clinical settings and won't be available or be dispensed for home use. Again, this seems pretty similar to the current situation in Canada where people can get access to psilocybin through what's called the Special Access Program. This special access program becomes available where conventional treatments have failed, are unsuitable or unavailable to treat patients suffering from serious or life-threatening conditions. So sure, it is available in Canada, but only under very specific conditions, and it's actually very difficult to qualify for this program. So it's not something that is gonna be prescribed widely, and I think that's very similar to what is gonna be happening in Australia. And just to put a finer point on this, I think this is actually less of a big deal than what is happening in U.S. states like Oregon and Colorado, where similar but less restrictive policies are emerging. For example, in Colorado, like I mentioned last time on The Mushroom Show, you are able to grow these mushrooms at home, whereas in Australia, under this prescriber scheme, or in Canada, under the Special Access Program, you are not able to do that. It does make me wonder, though, just out of curiosity, as this is going to be rolled out in Australia, who is going to grow the mushrooms? Is it going to be existing mushroom farmers, or are they going to be developed in pharmaceutical-type facilities? Maybe the way it's rolled out, they won't really need a large supply. After all, mushrooms pack a punch, and the volume of mushrooms required 
probably won't require too many growers even at a large scale. So overall, it's not entirely clear what this means. It's actually a little bit confusing and I know there are some people who think that this situation was rushed and it wasn't properly well thought out, but either way, it does feel like it's a step in the right direction. The bottom line is that psilocybin has just been reclassified as a medicine in a major country and that is a far cry from what we might have seen 10 years ago where that wasn't even a question. On to our next story. Now, way back in 1982, Canada actually made psilocybin mushrooms illegal. I found this really great clip from that era. Take a look. Magic mushrooms. Until now, a legal hallucinogenic that sent hundreds of people scrambling across fields searching for them. But today, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled the mushrooms are a drug and people who harvest or use them can be charged. Jerry Thompson reports. Farmers here in the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island have tried several different strategies in their ongoing battle against magic mushrooms and the people who come onto their property to pick them. Two years ago, some farmers tried making citizen arrests, while the police and Crown prosecutors tried to have magic mushrooms themselves declared illegal. Today's ruling makes magic mushrooms illegal, just like marijuana, and it means Barry Dunn can be tried for possession. Oh, uh, they just want to make another law and make something else illegal? The Supreme Court also said that farmers who unknowingly have magic mushrooms growing on their land are not guilty of possession. All they need do is destroy the mushrooms as they find them. Fast forward to 2023 and things have totally flipped because the government of Canada has just announced that they are investing a large sum of money into studying the potential benefits of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. Now I got to admit as a Canadian, I never expected that I would read a headline or a press release like this, especially directly from Canada.ca. And basically the idea behind this is, hey, you know, there seems to be a lot of potential benefits here, but we don't really know. So why don't we do some studies and try to figure out exactly what those could be? Now, I'm guessing a lot of people, when they read what these studies are actually going to be, think that it's already kind of a foregone conclusion. Like, yeah, we already kind of know this stuff. But when it comes to rescheduling, when it comes to governments changing laws, I mean, it really takes a lot more evidence kind of like we were talking about with the Australia situation. So I think that is kind of what is happening here. They're just building a foundation and trying to learn exactly how this could be potentially rolled out to benefit the most people. So here is some more information on the grant and they're looking at three different studies that they're gonna fund. So the first one is psilocybin assisted existential attachment and relational therapy for patients with advanced cancer which is a randomized controlled trial. The second study is going to be mechanisms supporting psilocybin assisted therapy to treat alcohol use disorder. And the third study is psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for treatment resistant depression, a randomized phase two clinical trial comparing one versus two psychedelic doses of psilocybin. Now it is a little bit interesting that these are the three specific things that they decided to study or decided to fund for those studies, because I don't think they're really gonna be breaking any new ground here. There are a lot of other studies that have been done that are similar or at least analogous to what they're proposing. For example, for the first proposed study that's looking at psilocybin for end-of-life anxiety, there was another relatively famous study that was done in 2016 that's titled Psilocybin Produces Substantial and Sustained Decreases in Depression and Anxiety in Patients with Life-Threatening Cancer a randomized double-blind trial. So here they studied 51 cancer patients with life-threatening conditions. Now this was a randomized double-blind crossover trial, so kind of the gold standard, which compared placebo to high-dose psilocybin. In this case, they say high dose is 22 or 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms. So very roughly about two to three gram doses of mushroom equivalent. Although it's hard to say exactly how that dose would compare to something like dry psilocybe cubensis because it's just not a direct comparison and the concentration can vary but I would say that is definitely a pretty reasonable what people would call a macro dose and here are the results of that study they say high dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinician and self-rated measures of depressed mood and anxiety along with increases in quality of life life meaning and optimism and decreases in death anxiety. At six month follow-up, these changes were sustained with about 80% of participants continuing to show clinically significant decreases in depressed mood and anxiety. 
Participants attributed improvements in attitudes about life, self, mood, relationships, and spirituality to the high-dose experience, with greater than 80% endorsing moderately or greater increased well-being and life satisfaction. Again, this probably isn't news to anybody who's watching this show. It's a pretty well-known study, but it will be interesting to see if the Canadian study shows the same or similar results. Again, for the second study that they're proposing here, Mechanisms Supporting Psilocybin-Assisted Psychotherapy to Treat Alcohol Use Disorder, there is another study that was done on this that showed very interesting results. This was again a double-blind placebo-controlled trial which included 93 participants, and they used two different administrations of high-dose psilocybin and measured how many days during the study participants had heavy drinking days. And here's what they found. The percentage of heavy drinking days during the 32-week double-blind period was 9.7% for the psilocybin group and 23.6% for the other group, a mean difference of 13.9%. So they say that mean daily alcohol consumption, which is the number of standard drinks per day, was also lower in the psilocybin group, and there were no serious adverse events among participants who received psilocybin. Again, those are pretty stunning results, right? So it will be interesting to see if the Canadian study can confirm that, if it's different in any way, uh, but either way, I'm really interested to follow what those results are going to be. And finally, for the third proposed Canadian study, this idea of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy specifically for treatment-resistant depression. Again, this is not necessarily anything new because there have been studies done on this exact thing, which have shown some pretty promising results. But the Canadian study seems to be specifically looking at the difference between one macrodose of psilocybin versus two macrodoses of psilocybin, which again is getting very niche, very specific. But if these things are going to be rolled out to actually help people with treatment resistant depression, these are the kind of things that are going to be really good to know. And keep in mind, there have been studies done where they looked at a single dose of psilocybin for treatment resistant depression, which is why we may have heard some of these really stunning headlines that a single dose can have such profound effects on something like TRD, which has been, by definition, resistant to other treatments. For example, in a 2022 study, which involved 79 participants, the researchers found that psilocybin at a single dose of 25 milligrams reduced depression scores significantly more than a one milligram dose over a period of three weeks but was associated with adverse events. Now, what I found particularly interesting about that specific study was the high level of adverse events or adverse effects. According to the researchers, 77% of the participants experienced some sort of adverse event. Now, to me, that seems really high because it doesn't seem to match with what people report outside of this trial unless you had a really low threshold for an adverse event. So I can see something like nausea uh, might be reported by a fair number of people. But when you look into the study, according to the researchers, they even considered things like euphoric mood or mood altering being considered as adverse events. Also, some of the other adverse events might not be associated with psilocybin. For example, one of them was depression, which is the reason why participants were in the trial in the first place. But it is hard to say for sure, which is why I think studies like this make a ton of sense. I think this is just three out of many more that we're gonna see, but either way, I'm really excited to see what the results of these are gonna be. On to our next story. Now, we talk a lot on the show about mycotechnology and how it is super cool. But one of the major themes that goes along with that is that mycotechnology and the applications of mushrooms in the real world are actually really hard to scale. Something might work really well on a lab or on a small scale, but when you try to scale it up to solve real world problems, it is really, really difficult. Now, does this mean we should never try? Well, of course not, right? Innovation is never a straight line, which is why I wasn't all that surprised to see the headlines this week, which was originally broken by Vogue Fashion, saying that Bolt Threads, which is the company that was behind the unleather or mycelium-based leather product called Milo, has ceased operations, at least temporarily, after struggling to scale production to a commercial scale. Even though they did have some serious backing, announcing partnerships with Stella McCartney, with Adidas, with French luxury group Keurig. Now, I'm not sure if this is a technical problem, because yeah, making mushroom leather, although it seems pretty straightforward, can be pretty difficult to scale, and maybe it isn't as straightforward as we think, 
or if this is simply a funding problem. The company said in a statement, despite our intensive efforts, the current macroeconomic climate has made it increasingly difficult to secure the necessary capital to support the scale up of emerging technologies. As a result, Bolt has made the difficult decision to pause Milo operations globally until a decision is made on whether or not we can continue our efforts. Now, I know what you might be thinking, how much money could it possibly take to grow mushroom leather or to make mushroom leather? And I was actually pretty surprised to find out that Bolt Threads, which was started around 2009, has already raised $300 million. And their last round of funding was in 2021. This was at a time where interest rates were super low and it was way easier for startups to raise money. But at the time they were valued somewhere between $1 billion and $10 billion. Now I gotta admit, $300 million is a lot more than I would have thought. And it does make me wonder like how much money were they seeking for this next round of funding? How much money would it actually take to bring this mushroom leather into full scale commercial production? And is it even a reasonable thing to be doing at all? But again, nothing happens in a straight line. Innovation is really difficult by definition. And I still think that we're gonna see a lot of mushroom based or mycelium based innovation in the world of material science without a doubt. For example, the exact same week that Bolt Threads announced they're shutting down, I saw an article about someone who is starting to make guitars out of mushrooms. Now, I wasn't really aware that this is apparently an issue, but maybe because of the certain types of wood that are used, apparently the guitar making industry has some sustainability issues. And according to this article, it says, traditionally, luthiers construct guitars with woods, including cedar, rosewood, mahogany, and ebony, depending on the tonal quality sought. It says wood, of course, is also biodegradable, but issues including overforesting have led makers like Rosencrantz, this is Rachel Rosencrantz who's making these guitars, have led them towards more sustainable options, reclaiming wood and sourcing from local woods. Now, looking at this, it looks like a very similar process to how mushroom building materials are made in any other context. Basically, you just take some sort of substrate, in this case, wood, and you grow mushrooms throughout into a preformed shape. In this case, a guitar shape. You can treat it and voila, you have a mushroom guitar. But to be fair, this one, I'm really having a hard time seeing how it could have a major impact. Because first of all, you're still using wood, right? That's the substrate that the mushrooms are growing on. And the mycelium is really just there to kind of bind everything together. So the way I think about it is you could just use the wood to make the mushroom. But I guess maybe there is a reason why you'd want something more like a styrofoam material. Again, I don't really understand how guitars are made, so it might make perfect sense. And still at the end of the day, it is pretty cool. Like I'll admit whether or not it's reasonable to do or not, it's still pretty neat to have a mushroom guitar. You can see, for example, in this picture, a, the body of the guitar, you can see a little reishi mushroom fruiting bodies. That looks like reishi anyway, is growing straight out of the guitar, which is super neat. And apparently it also sounds different. So maybe, I don't know, there's specific tonal qualities to mycelium infused materials. Uh, that would be kind of cool. I know a lot of people have seen these ideas where they like hook electrodes up to mushrooms and they make these kind of crazy cool sounds, which is obviously completely different, but it's still cool to think that you might have a specific mushroom guitar as growing reishi mushrooms and has a very interesting tonal quality. I mean, I'd totally love to have one of those. Again, I think the theme here is that mycotechnology is super cool, whether it be mushroom leather or mushroom guitars or mushroom coffins, like we've talked about before, or something way more practical, like a mushroom styrofoam replacement. I think we're gonna to continue to see mycelium technologies and mushroom technologies being used to solve real world problems but it might not be a straight line to get there. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Thank you so much for being here. It really is awesome to be able to come on here every couple of weeks and chat mushrooms with you. Again, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you wanna see future episodes of the show, plus help us hit our goal of reaching a 1 million subscriber mushroom channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. It really does help the channel grow and we appreciate it so much. If you want to hang out in between episodes of The Mushroom Show, I spend a fair amount of time on Twitter at FreshCapTony. That's where I do research for the show and hang out with other microfiles. It's just a really great place to connect in between episodes. So if you use Twitter, go ahead and hit me up there at FreshCapTony. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.